Welcome to Saltivation. The Saltivation Show is a podcast series featuring the leading voices in salt, where we talk about the issues and strategies to help you make sense of state and local tax. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Saltivation Podcast. Colorado sales tax collection is one of the most complicated systems to navigate in the country with the statutory and home rule jurisdictions. Colorado has migrated to a destination-based system as a result of Wayfair from a location in common, omitting the home rule jurisdictions unless physically present. Now, the home rule cities are able to get in on the action and impose their sales tax on businesses who have not had physical presence historically. The Colorado system is enough to push sales tax collectors over the edge. With its reputation for being one of the worst systems, is now intent on simplifying it with a centralized sales and use tax system called SUTS. As SUTS gains momentum, some issues are coming to light for participating businesses and jurisdictions. But as we get into that conversation, let's back up first and give a little history. Here to help us walk through that, through the what, why, and how is Ed Sealover, senior reporter for the Desmus Business Business Journal. Ed has been following the issue on behalf of his business audience since Wayfair was implemented in 2018. Ed, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me on today. Also joining us today is Laurel Witt, Associate Counsel with the Colorado Municipal League. Laurel will share with us how CML participated in this simplification. Thanks for having me. Laurel, thank you for joining us today. And before we really get into questions, we do want to congratulate Ed as being recognized by the Society of Professional Journalists as SPJ's Colorado 2021 Journalist of the Year. Ed, congratulations on behalf of Saltivation. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honor. Mm. <laughs> All right. So we're just going to dive right in. Ed, you've been with the DBJ for over 12 years and have been following the Colorado sales and use tax issues on behalf of your readers. Can you take us through how you became aware of the issues we're talking about and what you are following now on behalf of the businesses? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking me. And thanks again for having me on here today, Meredith. You know, I, I, I can't tell you the exact year, but I think it was around 2013 when the legislature really started uh, talking about going after um, sales from out-of-state vendors and having them taxed here. And that, uh, that, color, that conversation had fits and starts. There was a law passed that to allow them to go after some, but you had a physical nexus here. Um, and it was Wayfair, of course, that changed everything in 2017. And suddenly the state realized that not only uh, did it have the ability to go after out-of-state vendors and without a physical presence here, but that they really needed to conform their own law for in-state vendors in order to have everybody on the same playing field here. And so watching the several years that it took to walk through, how do we create, first, a law that's going to require everyone to go to destination-based sourcing? Uh, and B, how do we not make that incredibly burdensome on people and create a system for which it could work through uh, has been interesting. And it seemed to have gone from, there's no way we could do this, to, hey, look, we did it, to, hey, look, this is going pretty well, to, in recent months, some more complaints about, hey, maybe this is not going so well. That's a lot of hays, but they're making hay here. And it's a way to, uh, to, to really say, I think this is an issue that is going to continue to vex both the state, the local governments, and businesses for a while to come. And since it's so important to local businesses, I just feel the need to keep up on it. Well, and I think just in some of the conversations that we had, do businesses often reach out to the Denver Business Journal just as like an outlet to say, hey, here are just some of our concerns from just, you know, whether it's, you know, sales tax or just the business environment in general, do you, does the DBJ often become kind of like a sounding board for in-state businesses? It is not uncommon. Um, you know, the, the number of businesses that have reached out to me to speak about the sales tax system is pretty minimal. But I find that when it does happen is whenever something happens right after Wayfair or right after uh, the state announced we're ready to go live on July 1st with uh, destination-based sourcing this year. So yes, uh, on that and on other issues, I do hear from businesses and it's a good way to remember uh, how important some of these things are to local businesses and that what may seem a minor concern could be spread among a lot of businesses if somebody is taking the time to call me and talk about it. Yeah, well, and I will say, audience, sorry, Judy is also with us today, our proud Saltivation leader. So Judy, I I apologize (laughs) I omitted you from the intro, but (laughs) Judy will also be here today with us. 
Well, and I think it too, it's good that, you know, because oftentimes when the legislator kind of does something, we think about like our big in-state businesses and oftentimes we forget about like some of the smaller businesses and just, you know, just remembering that we have, you know, business owners and people who are participating in the Colorado economy on all sizes and scales, right? Judy, we often reference kind of the first trigger when Colorado went to the destination brace reporting kind of a public hearing. And there were, there were business owners from all over the state that like drove to Denver to be like, Hey, I want my voice to be heard. This is going to be really hard for me. Some were in tears. It was just very like, it was a nice reminder of just, you know, who, you know, who our business community is in Colorado. They really didn't understand it at the open hearings. If you recall, I don't know, Ed, if you were there, I don't know, Laurel, if you were there, but I mean, there was hundreds of people in these rooms listening to the Department of Revenue and there was they were giving a voice to it and having a microphone. I mean, I was just astounded at the stress in the room. It was palpable because people don't know how they're going to impose the rates. I mean, think about a small vendor that might ship to you in Aspen. They're in Thornton. They have a nice little shop, but they're going to go ahead and send you something out of city. Well, Aspen's in home rule, so you don't have to worry about that, but you might have to worry about Pitkin County, which is a county tax. So they're just up in arms about how the heck they were going to charge the tax in the first place. They knew how to collect their location-based reporting, i.e., I'm in Thornton, I'm in Colorado. Thornton may or may not be in these extra jurisdictions, the regional transportation, the cultural, the scientific district, but they could do that. That's one rate. But looking at thousands of, oh my gosh, people were, their heads were blowing off. And then no one really understood what that meant and the difference between de- location-based reporting and, and destiny. I mean, nobody got it, right? And the, and I don't even think the Department of Revenue did a great job disseminating the information to taxpayers. So they didn't really understand how to go for it. So, and if you don't have automation, so you can't really do the rates easily, even with our system, looking it up, give me a break. You know, think about that as, as a, a as to ship multiple places, you could never collect the tax at the ready without some type of software. And large businesses have automation, but small businesses are just putting a rate in a system or putting it on their receipt. So I think there was a lot of stress around that for sure in the beginning with just our destination reporting that happened with Wayfair. Well, and then Laurel, you're with CML, the Colorado Municipal League. And so what is CML's role in general? Yeah. Yeah. And again, thanks for having me on as well. Um, So the Colorado Municipal League has existed for about a hundred years and we represent, I know it's been a long time. um, And we represent 270 of the 272 municipalities in Colorado. And that includes both home rule and statutory self-collecting and non-self-collecting home rule municipalities. There's about 103 home rule municipalities in Colorado and 70 of them self-collect. So quite a large number as we've been talking about. Um, which, of course, adds to the confusion, Judy, as you were mentioning earlier. Um, and CML does more than sales tax. We represent issues ranging from um, police reform with our um, with a lot of these changes that are coming up to, to sales tax, to employment, anything that cities face and deal with on a daily basis. We represent them both in the state house, the legislature, lobbying on bills. Um, we also help with training and education. So we do a wide range of things. And this is one of the areas that we've gotten involved in. Well, partly because that's how you're funded, right? But let, yeah. let's just take a step back about the cities. I think there's a really miss informed public in America in general. You know, you live in Los Angeles, you live in New York, you live in Boston, Massachusetts. Everything isn't handled at the state level, right? Things are happening at the city level, like you were saying, fire departments, police. I mean, there's a lot of things that are locally administered, right? And county administered, our dams, our reservoirs. I mean, therefore, there's an infrastructure in place governmentally to oversee that need. It's not all mandated at the state or managed at the state. So they have to find some extra funding aside from what the state gives them, correct? Not to mention the fact our federal governments give state money. They don't always want to be beholden to that state money, i.e., I don't want to do what you tell me to do, federal government, so I want my own tax structure, right? Which is why we have state taxes in the beginning, and then cities and counties are the same, right? So sales tax, property taxes are a natural way they're funded, in addition to getting money from whoever else gives them money, right, besides us. And sales tax for home rural city, or for cities in particular is about 70% of our revenue. See, so, really so think about that. Yeah. Huge, huge amount of money. Yeah. But 
Yeah. And then, okay. So we've been around a hundred years as the cities. So let's talk about why the heck they're home rule. Yeah. So this, home, <laughs> what does home rule mean? Home rule is derived out of our Colorado constitution and home rule does exist in other states, but not all yep. the states. And in Colorado, it's one of the strongest. So we have some of the most power in the Colorado constitution, such as collecting sales tax at the local level, if a city chooses to do that. And we refer to it in passing as local control, just this idea that we want to be able to help our cities be able to help their citizens in the best way that they can. Um, so we have quite a wide variety of different cities here in Colorado. Um, anything from the Aspens and Tellurides of the world, which are very common cities all around the U.S. You know, people know it for ski towns, um, all the way to Denver, um, to Colorado Springs, to these more urban places that people come to work and live. So each of our cities has a different focus in what they want to do, um, and that allows this local power allows them to do that. Um, so it does it does include sales tax, of course, and some cities tax higher. Some cities will tax groceries because they only have one grocery store in their town, whereas others don't do that because they're big and they have other ways of taxing, such as such as sales taxes we've been talking about here on this call. So there's kind of a variety of these different cities and how they approach taxing. And then, of course, there are different ways that cities want to govern their citizens. Um, Different cities want to approach things like oil and gas differently or employment differently than maybe other cities do. So it allows our cities to kind of become these uh, laboratories of democracy. I think they used to call the states that um, this ability to try out different things and see what works. So home rule just allows them to do that in that way. I mean, home rule has been it's in the Constitution, but it's been slowly defined over the years through the court system and through the state legislature. So it's been one of those ever evolving ideas um, and home rule just means our ability to govern our cities within our within our little laboratories, within our little city. And it it isn't unlimited power. Um, of course, we're still defined by the Constitution. Um, we still are defined by some state statutes. So it's um, and by a case law, of course, as well. So it's just this idea that we want to be able to have the government closest to the people be able to decide what what kind of things govern them. Um, as you said earlier, sometimes taxing from the federal government looks different than a city. So it allows us to do that a little bit differently. Of course, you have a national chain, like say a Culver's, or maybe that's a franchise. I'm not even sure if that's a great example, but they might be housed in a different even state uh, where their headquarters is, but they put an operation in a McDonald's, a Culver's, or any, think about all the, the food that is it, it, kind of a national chain that has locations in different cities and they've got to deal with the complexity. Do they care about home rule? Absolutely not. They just want people to come buy their food at that storefront and they're located elsewhere. So they get very confused confused about the duties yeah. in the cities of residency, uh, you know, permitting and then the, you know, tax structure. So that I think adds this layer of complexity for entities that are not per se in the home rule in a way that's the same as I open a storefront, I have a shop in this city. I get it. That's my city. That's my place. I get my community. I get where I am. And a lot of out of state don't even get that. So it's a really a, a push pull of how we understand that as a business being local and being national. So it's a real big challenge, I think, for taxpayers. Yeah. And now we've got a situation where we could sell to somebody in another city and we have to collect the tax for that other city previous to home rule in the statutory destination cities because of Wayfair. Right, exactly. And and even in state, this has become a problem. There's some bigger organizations that were really on board with SUTs because it would make it easier for them to be able to collect around all the different cities in the state, yep. such as American Furniture Warehouse. They have a presence yep. in several home rule cities, and this would allow them, the SUTs program and Wayfair would allow them to collect in one place instead of having to file taxes you know, right. pre in 70 different pre places. Absolutely. Yeah. It's 70, you have to go in, sign in, get your license, put your information in. You could spend a day just filing all those returns because it each had to be done separately. Now, if you could put the data in one front in one location and then kind of just make sure it all ties out, the reporting becomes a little bit easier. Like California has uh, state level reporting for 252 or 256 jurisdictions at the local level. Texas has 1,714. 
So, but it all happens at the state level. So at least the reporting becomes a little bit easier because you're going into one system, one registration form, one uh, remittance form, even though you got to know the buckets. The buckets are still challenging. And and don't forget, it's not 70 cities that people have to think about here because of all the interaction of special districts with cities. There's over 400 taxing districts in the state of Colorado. So to use the example you had earlier, if that Aspen merchant is sending something to Thornton, they they better know which sanitation district they are in that's right. so they know the exact level of taxes they're paying. Yep. And that's a real challenge, I think, in and of itself. Our local, our, 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 the way the web is and the lines are drawn, it's like you have these complicated geographic structures where I'm in Denver, but then I'm in this because that fits around the regional transportation district, all that good stuff. Makes the, the situsing of a sale very complicated for a, for a vendor. Yeah, and I will say that self-collecting is only for home rule jurisdictions. So thankfully, all of these should already be on the subsystem. But as you said, you still have to know which districts to right. close in on. So, And that's really hard when you're the one doing it. And you're a small business, especially. Yeah. But honestly, it's hard for large businesses, too. I mean, there's a lot that happens in a business in order to get a sale to a customer. And you betcha they know how to invoice and you betcha they know how to ship or deliver, right? But Putting the tax on it, not so simple, right? And certainly not your first and primary function to collect tax for the government, right? Your business is to make money (laughs) and make a business, right? So this extra functionality that that business has to be basically the invoicing system of government, in my opinion, needs to be treated with more gratefulness on the government's part because that is their basically collection system. And there's a push-pull there of like making it simple, but honoring the home rules, you know, and and their ability to mandate their own laws and enforce tax. And Judy, the collection piece and, you know, Ed, you had, you had mentioned that there were maybe some misunderstandings within the business community that, that were brought to your attention that about the actual like collection of the tax where, you know, you were getting feedback that, you know, Sutz wasn't going to collect the tax. Yeah. Or, or it was one of the particular concerns I've heard lately is the inability to interface Sutz with your own website. And the idea, and, and this is one particular merchant I had spoken to uh, who said, look, people come to my website, they might want to buy, they, they push buy, and they can't do it because I then have to figure out where they live and what the tax calculation That's is. That's right. And then I have to get back to them. And if they've even decided to give me their contact information, I may have lost the sale in that time period there. So there's a lot mm-hmm. of concern that Sutz, while it's wonderful for calculating and remitting taxes to the state is not as useful unless you want to invest a a decent amount of money hiring a contractor to interface such with your website. It's not as useful for interacting with customers. No. And not only that, but Suts is one thing. What about the other 46 places in America, states, 45, DC is not a state, it's a district, but the 46 states, if we want to call DC a state, that have a sales tax. So it's one thing to worry about Colorado. What if you're selling to Illinois? What if you're selling to Indiana? I mean, you still might have to collect there because of Wayfair. So you're not going to just worry about Colorado alone if you could have customers everywhere. And that's the other complexity that's layered in. So Suts is not a one size fits all solution. Nor is it really honestly a solution if you're a multi-state vendor selling outside of the state of Colorado. So you'd really need something larger than even the SUTS platform to figure out your tax. Well, right. And it's, you know, kind of with the small businesses. And I'm there's a jewelry maker in Carbondale that I really love. And she uh, she shut down her website. And I was like, huh, I wonder if that's because now she might have to like start complying with all of this stuff. And she's going to start selling through Etsy going forward. And it's like, well, Etsy's going to collect that as part of a marketplace. But now she doesn't have to reconfigure her API and her website to do all of this destination-based collection, you know, because it is, it's easy. And I use that that term loosely, right? If someone comes into your store and they buy something, because it's a point of sale, you know, the rate in which, you know, you're located, or it's easy enough to say, Hey, or if you pick up the phone and say, Hey, I want you to ship something to my house in Denver, you know, as you know, looking up an address for Denver, but People who buy things on websites want it to be real time. And so then what that means is you've got to connect your website and your API to like a third party collection system, which again, costs money to do that. So it's like, okay, is is the ability to sell and collect tax correctly through my website worth the additional cost? And is it going to, you know, 
are we going to get there? And so I think that's what it sounds like, Ed, you're hearing from the business community. You're just like, there's just all this extra stuff that I don't know. You know, I'm not, I don't want to break the law, but I also don't want it to be so hard. So what do I do? Or expensive. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I think, and, and to a point that Judy made earlier, uh, I don't know that the Department of Revenue was very successful in explaining exactly the role of SOTS. Because I followed this process yes. for years. And when uh, the businessman who called me about this concern said, hey, this is, uh, this is a problem, I said, well, the SUT system was never designed for this. It's the same thing the Department yep. of Revenue will tell you. Uh, and he said that was not conveyed to us. Many of us got right. on there thinking this would be a one-stop system, yep. not just for collecting and remitting to the state, but figuring out payments that others have to remit to us. And now now I, I think there are questions around, well, how do you deal with that? Do you just say, sorry, this is not our problem. You can go out and hire someone to interface the system if you want to pay more money. There is a senator, Jeff Bridges, a Democrat from Greenwood Village, who heads the Capital Technology Committee and who's particularly concerned about this. And one of the ideas he is thinking about is seeing if, of course, businesses that collect under $100,000 do under $100,000 in annual revenue right now aren't part of the destination system, except, of course, Laurel, if they are paying to a home rule city. But he is thinking about extending that moratorium further out, saying maybe this just isn't the way that small businesses need to deal with it until we can figure out how we can adjust our system to be more that one-stop shop. Now, I don't know, and, and he admits, I don't know, he, he says, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that this year before the July first changeover to destination-based sourcing for everyone. But uh, but that's one of the ideas that's being thrown around to address this problem. But even that, once again, it just solves the Colorado problem, maybe. And what I find is, well, most of the clients that talk to me are doing business in more than one state, right? So Colorado is just one little piece of the pie. They've got to deal with the whole pie. So, And you need to have the capacity to deal with it. And that does require some kind of system of record, API interface, some or something to get your rates. There are over 13,000 rates in America. You know, if you combine all the jurisdictions, I mean, there's over 30,000 water districts in America. Did anybody know that? Um, you know, there's however many counties we have in our nation, how many cities. I mean, we have a lot and each one of those has a rate. So it does require some type of automation, which is why you see these software companies going crazy and all they're going public and making tons of money because everybody's, they're trying to sell to everybody. But it is expensive for a small vendor that's, if they're not making 100000 a year, is it worth having a business, Right. So that becomes prohibitive to even starting and being entrepreneurial. So well, and I and I don't think it's just you know the business community that has reluctance towards sets. You know, Laurel, I think you know, are there is some reluctance within the city. So what do you think? What has kind of CML heard or done to kind of address some of that reluctance within you know the the jurisdictions and municipalities that you all represent? Yeah, it's a good question because there is some reluctance. Even now, not all of the cities are on sets. I think it's 50 out of 70 are on sets right now. And it's some of it has to do with cities wanting to see how it works. Um, some cities are kind of sitting back and seeing like, how's it going? How's the integration? Um, and just like the business issue, there are issues on the back end with integrating with cities technology. If a city has the same software as sets, which is the same organization called MuniRevs, if they have the same system, it's easy. But if they don't, it's not. And so that's causing right. some back-end issues as well. I know some cities are having to hand count and hand write in things about um, to like make sure that the right taxpayer is lined up with the right number and all the stuff. So there's some complication on the back end. Originally, when it first started, they I think there was just this trend of are cities going to jump on the trend of economic nexus? Mm -hmm. Is are we going to do the single point of remittance portal? So we had to talk through that a lot with the Department of Revenue. As you guys know, under Wayfair. One of the, the factors was having a single point of remittance portal, um, and we didn't want to cause businesses more issues with having to remit to all these different cities. Um, of course, that would result in a lawsuit, and also it's way too complicated to have to remit to all these different cities. So we were trying to figure out how the single point of remittance portal worked, what it looked like to work with the Department of Revenue. Some cities have never worked with the Department of Revenue, like Denver, you know, has always been the self-collecting idea or has been for a really long time. So going back and working with the state is a little bit different. Um, Denver has more auditors than the state of Colorado does. So they're just a bigger operation than the state of Colorado. Mm -hmm. So just trying to work with them um, and figure that out was a challenge. But it's been really interesting to see how it's all played out. I think 
as Ed said earlier, there's been some hiccups and some, you know, um, especially for the business side, there's been some from our side as well. So we're just trying to figure that out as we go along. The hesitation, I think, is getting better. Well, I was just saying, there's two two third parties, is TTRUS yep. and MuniRev. So they're not even the state. So I think that actually helped get over the hurdle. Yep. First of all, they're made for business. They're built for business. So they're built to make it as easy as they possibly could make it. Yep. And their product <laughs> From, was beautiful. It looked really great. And it helps business be successful because there's a tremendous amount of risk in miscollecting. Yep. So that's why using those products was sort of a way for the state, for the cities to build trust because they weren't trusting the state. There's like an inherent distrust with the state for some reason. And I really feel like it kind of goes way back in time to before technology was very good and a lot of things that just are just not that good, right? That have really gotten tremendously better. I mean, good. I think about my career, the internet. I mean, that's just like, was even in its infancy when I first started working, right? So that's just part of our life. Our phone is our little computer. I mean, so much more information is readily available and technology is better for them to get their money. Because I think that was a big issue was they weren't getting their money. Yep, That's what it's all about. Yeah. So they self-collected, and, right? And the politics too behind it. So the state would be like, well, we're not going to tax groceries for home consumption. Yeah, And this little tiny city is like, that's the only way that's we it? tax. So I think there was a little bit of distrust there too with the political side of things as well. I wonder if we'll see some changes in that too to destination reporting where you get more humans in a location, you're going to get more tax because now they're ordering off Amazon or whatever. So therefore the tax is really coming from your home than from your uh, grocery store per se. I do think one of those, what you just mentioned, the food for home consumption or the food or whatever, that is a huge issue. I mean, we have 81 exemptions at the state level and we have not the same exemption at the, at the city level. I mean, for a great example of software, state doesn't tax e-delivered software. A lot of the cities do. In fact, I think all the cities do just about. So oh, that is a big shift of mentality of like, oh, how do I collect tax on software in Denver if I don't have to collect it at the state? That is a, That requires a workaround, uh, even your software platform, because it's not a destination rate. Like just charge this one rate. Nope, charge this partial rate. Remember what you charge and then throw that money to the city of Denver and not to the state of Colorado. That's a complexity that a lot of business has that's just not an easy, as simple as a full rate on an invoice. Right. So there's 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 the rules and the rates that are re- really make it almost impossible to really collect properly without some technology behind your invoicing process. Right. Right. So that, and I think that's what we were hoping for is that sets would help us get there. Uh-huh. Yeah. And as we've been talking about. Well, hopefully about. they see the money and they'd see the, yeah. th- well, then I'm, I was always hoping like the more information we had in terms of the disparities and the commonalities, maybe we'd see some unraveling of that. So for example, if you're saying a city is very dependent on their grocery store collecting tax, that's their primary vendor. And that's where the real money's coming from. And they saw that their community was giving them tax because they're buying things and now they're getting taxed on all their home deliveries that you'd see the money shift right? You see more money. Maybe we can not tax as many things because that is the biggest challenge we have is the difference in taxes between the state and the cities, not to mention the rates, but just the difference in taxing, which I think is very hard on business. Yeah, absolutely. And it's confusing. And we define things differently, which is perfect. Oh, we yeah. tried to solve a few years ago with standard definitions and we've gotten yes. pretty far, but... But even the but our state doesn't conform to that. The state doesn't conform to the standard definitions. The cities are getting on board, but the state hasn't figured that out. I don't know, Ed, if you have any thoughts on that, because that's a that's an interesting one in of itself that the state won't even step on. They won't even think about it. Well, to, I, mean, to, I mean, there's a lot of business uh, folks that say, "Well, I just wish we had standard taxation of you know what's getting taxed <laughs> in each city." And 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 I know. Yeah. Uh, I, I deal with the CML executive director a lot, and his head explodes when I mention that. You know, the, the idea of stepping on home rule authority of cities. Yeah. There, there really is almost no way. The standard definitions, and, and Laura, I don't know if you know what the numbers are on that. I know at one point there was about 50% of cities that were signed on to the standard definition. There's uh, more now. Okay. It's about 50% now, uh, yeah. There's a, a link on our website. There's a, that's the way of getting at it, but there's no possible way you could really say, okay, this tax is applicable across the state. It just varies so much from city to city. I think that's an issue that 
uh, unless the state wants to go to the mat and and withdraw home rule authority, which it doesn't, then I don't think you can get around that. Now, I find one of the more interesting concerns now, and, and this again is coming out of the, the Capital Technology Committee, is the idea that some cities, uh, and I understand it's, it's not a large number, some cities are now requiring that out-of-city vendors who submit tax revenue to them, which is mandatory July 1st, are requiring a business license. Actually, I understand a lot of cities are requiring Mm -hmm. this, but the trick is most cities aren't charging for the business license. Some cities are actually asking, uh, going back to our example, that Aspen businessman to buy a business license in their city the same as... uh, as, uh, Someone who has a storefront in that city and is using, you know, the roads and the sidewalks and all of that stuff versus just someone who's sending a good to a constituent of that jurisdiction. Exactly. And I know in talking to uh, to CML and to uh, the fellow in Arvada, uh, whose name, I apologize, I can't remember, who headed the committee looking into this, uh, the recommendation was, look, don't charge for, for licenses outside the city unless you feel like you have to. But I think this is still an issue that is, is going to be debated going forward. And I know one that, again, Senator Bridges said he wants to look into, though there isn't a definitive way to solve this quite yet because of home rule properties. So, you know, I don't know that that got us anywhere to explaining or solving problems, but I think it just yep. talks to the complexity of what happens when the state tries to simplify the system. I mean, I think it's come a long way since 2017, I don't think it's ever going to get all the way to where people want it to be. Now, Laurel, and I want to give you an opportunity because I know CML, like, you know, we've, we've talked, you know, CML has, is trying, right? Like they are kind of, and I don't want to speak for CML because I don't work for CML, right? But, you know, if you want to speak to kind of what Ed said regarding the, the licensing fees and whatnot. Sure. Yeah. So, um, what Ed had mentioned earlier, so Ezekiel Vasquez is his name from the city of Arvada. Yes. So we have a committee. Its long name is the CML Sales Tax Simplification Committee. It was started in the 90s, early 90s, when the first round of standard definitions came out. And I will say that the state was supposed to get on board with our standard definitions, and they did not. Um, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, so, no, it's an interesting issue. It is, it is. So back to business licenses. At the very beginning of the pandemic and and the starting to talk about SUTs and this kind of all of these conversations started to happen right around the same time. Um, we sat down and talked about business licenses and our committee is represented by all the home rule self-collecting jurisdictions have their finance director or some other finance staff on there. And then we talked about this issue. So I think maybe some folks weren't present at that meeting or maybe we need to bring it up again. It is an issue that we have flagged and want to talk about again um, because business licenses are something that I think are really problematic for different... Like, there's no way a business in Massachusetts cares about getting a business license in all the self-collecting home rule. 70 times 20 bucks is like 1,500 a year in license fees. I mean, no way. And I guess there's the interesting thing about this license issue is some are called a business license, some are called a sales tax license, some are interchangeable. I get having a business license if you have a situs in a location. No Mm -hmm. question. I'm here. Business license is something different, but a sales tax license, if you're going to Sutz, uh uh-uh, uh, you get to use the state's license. You don't have a separate license fee, but that 20 bucks can really add up. And the problem is, especially as a small uh, vendor, uh, but even as a large vendor, can you imagine how much it would cost you to collect tax in 70 extra cities if they all charge you 20 bucks? Yeah. Not to mention adding the destination cities that are statutory that also have business licenses and sales tax license. So we have, I was calculating and, cut and telling Kevin, your boss, that could be like $18,000 a year. I mean, there are cities, the town of Blue River, where I have a home outside of Breckenridge, it's one seventy-five dollars a year for the privilege of collecting their lodging tax. $175, yeah, right? and lodging That's tax a is lot. a whole other issue. But yeah. I think that these business licenses, most home rule jurisdictions aren't charging for them. That that wasn't the goal. Yeah. The ones that are, it's definitely a conversation we have to have. I think it should be side of space if you're going to have it. Like I have a location, not I am giving you tax, yeah. right? I'll collect, if you if I'm collecting a sales tax for you and you get it now on Suts, no sales tax license, that goes to the state. Sorry, it's 58 bucks to the state, but the no business license unless I have a situs. But the laws around that are not very clear yeah. about how they're allowed to impose it. And who's going to spend a lot of time and money fighting a $40 fee? Right. And you got to get a lot of people to hire a lawyer for that. Yeah. <laughs> and I think there is two distinct conversations here between a business license without a fee and the, that with a fee. Part of the reason yeah. we're having business licenses without a fee is because 
So that doesn't give us all the information or it gives us yeah. incorrect information. There's been some issues yes. with that side. And then the that WICIP fee is something that obviously we are talking about and really want to address and, you know, with our municipalities. And we can appreciate that they deserve to have that money for good reasons. But yeah, how it's getting done, I think it's very confusing for taxpayers. And it is an unfortunate byproduct of such because information is being disseminated through the state filing where the counties and the cities are getting that information like, oh, you have a new registrant in Gunnison County. You're located in Mount Crested Butte. I want a business license. I'm not in out Crested Butte. I am actually an out-of-state seller that happened to have to give you destination tax. But the cities know that because they knew these new, they know these new vendors are opening up within the state system. So there's a little bit of disconnect. And then certainly they do what they need to do administratively to say, hey, I see you're here. Give you know, you need to get a business license. And they're like, but I'm not here. I'm just giving you six bucks because somebody bought something from me and it went to your city. So it is a bit of a challenge. I hope we'll get through that. I mean, I think it's sort of a natural byproduct of what happens when you create that and information is starting to get disseminated and then they don't know what to do with it. It's sort of outside the norm, yeah. right? Yeah. And there's a lot of question about where the money's coming from, who's, you know, because sometimes that's, we'll just have like, you can fill in your own form and sometimes it won't say the name of the business remitting city. Uh-uh. Or it's like a little bit confusing. So I yes. think we will work through the fee issue, hopefully. But I think the overall business license issue is an ongoing thing with Suts and just trying to work through some of the, the hiccups that come with starting a new single port of remittance portal. I wish there was like a chart on it though, like where you knew, like, cause it's really hard to even figure that out within their ordinances. Do they have one? Do they not have one? You have to go to each single website for each city and town and figure out what the heck they expect you to do. Well, cause and it, it is wouldn't not be an that clear because it's, it's like a form that you fill out with the tax department usually. Yeah. It's a fee and it's sort of administrative. It's not necessarily even legal, not legal, but it's not enumerated in law. Oh, we charge this $6 license or whatever. Yeah. Right. It's allowed to be done as an administrator of, as a government. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're going to see some hiccups there, a lot of them, but you know, as with anything, you're going to have hiccups. Right. Well, and on kind of information dissemination, Ed, are you hearing anything else from that business community? You know, we've mentioned just the the fact that SETS isn't a rate collection system and this licensing fee. Is there any other kind of thing that you're hearing where people wish they knew more about? Like that they had more information regarding something specifically related to this, like, you know, anything sales, tax, this transition? I mean, what who I'm hearing from are usually the people who are very involved in this, who are aware of such, who are aware of the switch from origin-based to destination-based sourcing. What I hear constantly from them is, I'm yeah. worried what happens come July 1st, because most business people don't have the time, especially if you have uh-huh. a small business, to follow this kind of conversation, to follow these kind of changes. And, and I think that's going to be the big question. I mean, how, how do cities, how did the state get this message out to the people who don't know what's going on, who have just been, you know, traditionally uh, calculating their taxes based on their, their business address? How, how, do you, how do you emphasize what's happening? How do you react to it? Because I'm willing to bet we're going to see a lot of people who remit taxes yeah. wrong for the next year after July 1st, you know? So, I mean, do, do you as the state go after them hard? Do you just say, hey, thanks, but here's how you have to do it instead? Uh, I think that's the big concern now is is not, you know, what what businesses know, but what they don't but, know and well, how do you get that out? And especially too, we're just coming off, you know, I hate the <laughs> unprecedented times like thing, but it's just like, hey, if I have made it through all of 2021 and I care all of 2020 and I can make it to July 1st, 2021, like, <laughs> hell yeah, like I'm still around versus just like, all right, now I have to figure out how as an Aspen-based business to collect tax in Thornton. Like, you know, there are other things that are on top of mind for businesses coming, you know, as we kind of not wind up the pandemic, but like, you know, ease up on some of our restrictions and whatnot, just from like a business community in general. Like, hey, I'm still here, thank God. But now I don't want to, you know, because you hear the horror stories that make the paper that's like, oh, XYZ business shut down because they got a million dollar sales tax assessment you know, that we don't want our businesses to be victim of, you know, of a sales tax, whoopsie. Yes, I, I, I agree. And, and again, I think that's, uh, I wish there was, uh, any of us had an answer right? to that, but I, I think that's that's going to be figured out as we go along here. 
Well, and kind of on that, Laurel, have you seen, you know, with some of the hesitation with maybe some of the home rule jurisdictions where kind of the pandemic created like this online buying spree, right? Where it's kind of like, man, I wish, like now I really, I'm missing out on some taxes that I could have had, you know, if we, you know, had the ability to, you know, collect taxes from non-physically present businesses. Has that kind of like incentivized companies to come yeah. on board? Yeah, I think so. Not think? companies, the governments, cities. the cities. Yeah. <laughs> or, gover- um, sorry. Absolutely. At the beginning, so sets and, and I said it earlier, sets and the pandemic all kind of happened around the same time. It was all great. Right. Yeah, it was like all at the same time um, in March of last year, which was a little bit chaotic for all of us. Yes. <laughs> but <Right>. as... <laughs> The city started seeing money coming in through that way. They started jumping on sets a lot faster. So I said we have about 50 of 70 cities. Um, I think it would have been a lot slower of an onboarding process. Really? Yeah, I think it would have. Yeah. It wasn't for this kind of dichotomy of the world changing plus the pandemic and like seeing taxes coming in through online businesses. Yeah, what's just like how everything changed all at the same time. I think that's why we were able to get so many cities, including big cities like Denver, to jump on board with sets. Right, like Uber, you think about Uber Eats, Instacart, like, yeah, maybe I'd adopt it. Maybe I wouldn't. I got COVID. We figured out how to sign up for Instacart because we had to quarantine for two weeks. You had to figure it out. We weren't allowed to go to the grocery store or interact. Now, mind you, maybe people could have brought us food, but good golly, right? Don't come meet us with COVID. Yeah. So we like figured out the Instacart thing so we could get things brought to us. Like, and I'm sure a lot of other people were doing that even before we did that, you know? Especially Um, some of the older folks um, or people who are more sensitive to some of the things that were going on. Yes. And I think... One thing that we get asked a lot is like, well, did you want Amazon? But Amazon already had voluntary remittance with a lot of our cities, including Denver. Yeah. Um, and they have a warehouse in Aurora, but... I was to say they have a warehouse. <laughs> yeah, they have a warehouse there. But a lot of our other cities they had, they were already voluntarily remitting to us. So it was more like these like online delivery groceries or small businesses. That being said, by the time Sets was up and running, by the time we got our ordinances, it took, it was well into 2020, at the beginning of 2021, before they really started collecting and seeing the the benefits of it. But I think even now the the pandemic has changed the way a lot of people shop and will continue to shop. It was already happening. I think Ed, you said that the, the conversation started in 2013. I think that's really true. You've seen that oh, yeah. change for many years to online sales. Um, and so cities are recognizing that this is important and they want to work on this to make it viable for businesses and right. for us as well. Yeah. So I think that's why you see so many cities jumping on board. That's a good thing. But there's still that, I did, I got into a lot of the hearings in the beginning where they're explaining how it's going to work and all that. And there was a lot of fear amongst the cities that, you know, the state wouldn't know where they were, right? And that's not true because TTRUS did rooftop rates. They know where you are. Yeah. So if you have good address information as a vendor, there is a way to cite us that sale. And so think- there is some complexity around understanding that. But that I think was something where you, people have maps in some of these counties. Like, like they really didn't have automation, right? But now automation exists from the business world, which the states adopted, so you can get some accuracy around where the rate should occur. And I think previous to TTR, there was a couple of different vendors that they used that weren't mm-hmm. really great at that. Yep. And I think that's where okay. the fear came from. Yeah. Yeah, they learned that TTR was a really good resource that they actually did, yes. you know, did a really good job. Um, because the yep. previous vendors, I can't remember who they are, but they just weren't as good. And I think cities were afraid. Okay of relying on a vendor that could mess up their sales tax, especially right. um, you get cities like Crested View and Mount Crested View. Like, that's oh, amazing. Yeah. So Yes. Yeah, I didn't even know those were two. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Laurel and Judy, but incumbent on this, there is safe harbor with the SUT system where just in case the vendor yeah. does mess your address up, it doesn't right. go back on the business. That is, uh, that, that's yeah, on the, the vendor right. in the state mm-hmm. at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because there's there's a safe harbor provision, right? Which generally means if if we you have an approved system that you rely upon and you can prove out that you got here's the address, here's the rate that generated from this, you know, you're not subject to kind of penalties based on that reliance of that yeah. rate. Correct. Mm-hmm. And, and does that, uh, Judy, do you know, does that rate go beyond SUS? Does that go for other vendors as well, for, for businesses that tr- 
choose to use something other than the SUT system to determine location and taxation? Um, I don't think, unless you're a certified software provider, okay. which many of the vendors are actually, okay. like Vertex is and Avalara, like they're all CSPs. So, and I will be honest, I don't have a lot of people that would ever do manual. I don't work with clients that would just look up rates manually because that would be a big enough business necessarily to engage our firm. Most of our clients use software, mm. right? So really we have to make sure the software product is doing what it needs to do at the local level so they can properly collect the right rate. So that is the least of their concerns in some ways because they're, they've already bought into app having automation because they don't just care about Colorado. That's why the sets thing to me is fine. But once again, most of my clients are dealing across the nation. So they Colorado is one story, but they got to deal with rates, 13,000 rates in America, right? So they're, they have different concerns than just relying upon sets per se. So I feel like that just really carves out a very small piece of the tax pie, but that doesn't mean it's not an important piece for sure with small, with small medium vendors that are doing business locally, but also want to figure out how to collect the right rate. And I will say just one thing jumping on here is that we've been looking at hold harmless provisions as well at the step three yeah. level. It's not something that we have definitely implemented, but it's something that we've been talking about a lot. Have you? Hold harmless. That's really yeah. neat, especially if people do adopt automation. I have had more of a sales tax audit in this my career where people don't know how to put it in the right bucket. They don't even, I mean, we probably, may, you may be familiar with the case Quest, yep. which is now CenturyLink, didn't even know where their use tax went, didn't realize they were in one city versus another, remitted to the wrong place. I mean, talk about the worst thing that could ever happen is filing in the wrong bloody city and giving them the money and then being out of statute and not getting the money back and having to owe it somewhere else. Well, and I remember when I, when I first started at KPMG in 2005, like our sales tax guy, I was like, why does he have so many maps in his office? And like, you would see him, I was like, you're a lawyer and you're like, <laughs> you're studying like topography in your downtime? Like he would pull out these giant maps and he had them all highlighted. And he's like, okay, this address is here because it was really before like there yeah. was a good reliable system to check the rate. And he's like, oh no, I'm validating a sales tax rate for whatever reason. I was like, yeah, oh, that's... Wow, that's but that's not so many companies can afford to hire somebody to do that. If you think about it, right? I mean, right? Or they do they understand where the sale occurs? I think there's a real there's a so much. I don't know. Sometimes I just I get so frustrated with even other CPAs, even lawyers saying, "Can you just give me a list?" And I'm like, there are a lot of nuances with this field that are very detail specific. And if you don't understand the details, you can't understand how to apply the tax law to it. And that is an unfortunate byproduct of our system, just in general, um, that puts a lot of onus on vendors to be the invoicing arm of the government and figure out where a sale occurs. If people don't understand that. That's not their business primary purpose, right? To collect sales tax. So it is a it is an interest. I wonder, I am hopeful, I guess you got to have hope, right? That with more technology, with more information, with more money, <laughs> we're going to see assimilation and more parity and because it's just going to flow in. Like maybe we won't rely on the grocer, right? We'll rely on something different. But I do think, you know, let's just take a step back on that because Laurel, maybe you could explain you know, why we have these home rules a little bit, because there is a reason why they don't want to get along with the state. And it's not that they don't want to get along, but they want to enforce differently than the state. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it goes back, I mean, several, several years ago, but for cities, it's just serving the community that they're in. And each of the different communities are slightly different. They have different needs yeah. and wants. You know, um, a ski town like Aspen is much different than some of our rural um, Eastern Colorado communities. And so yep. for us, having an ability to um, to be able to elect local leaders that are directly impacting us was really important um, for the state of Colorado. And home rule was a thing that happened, you know, I think it was like the early 1920s. It was it was a really long time ago. Right. And it was something that was chopped around to a bunch of different states in Colorado. It really worked well because, um, because I think we're a Western state. We want to rely on the local leaders that we have. We want to be able to have some independence. So there's that. And for tax purposes, being able to collect at the self you know, at our level, first of all, like we mentioned earlier, the Department of Revenue hasn't always been the most reliant source or or the legislature for some of our cities for different reasons. But additionally, our cities are, um, home rule is really in a, in a way for them to be able to collect and remit and provide the services that work really well for their jurisdictions. We mentioned property taxes and sales taxes. So cities mostly rely on sales taxes, counties mostly rely on property taxes. There's just different ways that these taxes come in and out. 
and are able to um, better serve our citizens. For example, some of our cities really care about environmental reason or environmental causes or outdoor space. So their citizens are willing to pay a little bit more taxes in order to have some of that outdoor space or fight for environmental causes. Um, that's just one example. So there's kind of different approaches to that, and it allows cities to be able to be a little bit more flexible in being. Able and if to you do don't, that. and if you don't develop everything, then you aren't going to generate revenue from it, right? So if you're willing, if you're preserving, then where do you generate your revenue? Exactly. Yeah. And so the citizens are willing to pay a little bit more. They'll say, vote yes. Here in Colorado, too, we have to vote on all of our taxes in our elections. Yeah. So um, under a constitutional amend- amendment called the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. And because of that, it allows cities to kind of see, you know, where do you want to spend your taxes? Do you want to have more preserved space or do you want to have more development? Do you want to do more construct, you know, like have more zones of the city that are for shopping districts or whatever, whatever the issue is. And it allows cities to work with their citizens a little bit more versus the state. I mean, it's kind of the same at the federal level, right? Like federal versus state, like Mm -hmm. states have a little bit more ability to be flexible with what their citizens need. So do cities here in Colorado. Um, So that's kind of the goal. Is that what you were getting at, Judy? Did I miss something? Yeah. And I think it's important. I always feel like if people understand the purpose of tax or the purpose of administration, maybe they'll feel a little bit less annoyed with it. (laughs) We have a lot of I feel like we have a lot of anger in America about tax and it's What's that thing? certainly Death at the federal taxes, level. Right? Yeah. Right. And so I feel like, but it does provide a lot of benefit to our overall society and it preserves these communities that quite honestly would just get raised. You know, we would, it, it, we can't leave open space and we can't dedicate bike paths because they don't generate revenue unless we put a toll on them. Right. right? So or, how else do we like, fund this? Like Aspen or, or Telluride who want these big ski resort areas that want to be able to like, you know, have their spaces for all the skiers that come in and, and are tourists yep. or whatever. They're able to do that in a different way or be able to restrict buildings or whatever to be yes. able to allow their town to be more skier from I keep using skiing because I think most pe- people know that Colorado is a great skiing place, but. Well, and I always think like Larimer street, like that was yes. one of them. That is probably the most adorable street in downtown Denver. Thank you, Dana Crawford. But that street would have been raised if those people, if the people hadn't come together and saved those buildings. And, yeah. and that has served to be a solace and a, and a destination for a lot of people to see that community now because it hasn't been redeveloped. Right. It's been, what do you call it? Not redeveloped, but being raised. I mean, reuse, constructive reuse. Yeah, Still bringing like in revenue. Modern buildings. Yeah. yeah well, and all of our I little just, downtown areas, like almost right. every city in Colorado has this cute little downtown area yeah. um, that's for food and restaurants and are usually from the good old Western days. So yes. um, those are all preserved and able to be preserved through different districts and taxing powers. Yeah. Well, and as we wrap up, I want to ask kind of one more question, each of you, Laurel and Ed. Laurel, what would you say are, you know, maybe the top two priorities, if you can kind of say that for CML in 2021, even though, you know, the oddly enough, somehow the year's already almost half over. Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks for asking it. I So obviously we really care about home rule power. We want our cities to be able to to um, build the cities that they love. We also really care about our statutory cities. So I think for us, it's preserving the ability to um, to be able to do things like tax, but also do it in a way that's beneficial to businesses. So for us, it's about working together, about collaborating. So that's one of the biggest things for us moving forward in 2021 is how can we continue to work with the set system to be able to make it more viable, both for the cities and for businesses, to be able to do things like maybe add lodging taxes to it someday. That would be really helpful for some of our remote folks. So things like that, just like trying to make it more of a sustainable business long-term, I think is really important for us. Like having the business tax discussion. So, and working with the state and trying to make it the best system that we can from our side. I mean, we can only do so much, of course, but um, so that's a really big thing for CML as far as tax in 2021. And additionally, I think it's just about recovery. What does it look like to recover from the pandemic? So some cities did okay during the pandemic because of remote sellers, because they rely a lot on grocery stores and we were all going grocery shopping and that's it in 2020. But there are some cities that didn't do as well, um, especially some of those cities in in different parts of the place, state where people weren't still traveling to during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So I think recovery is a really big one. How do we recover from this? How do we make it so that our economies are more stable again? So those are kind of our two biggest priorities is looking at those issues. And Ed, what would you say is one of the best things that we should 
keep in mind or be aware of from a business perspective related to this, you know, kind of sales tax shift? I, I think the overwhelming thing that I hear from readers and from business groups and from businesses is just don't forget how burdensome this can be in a small business. You know, I, I think in when we started this discussion as a state a decade ago, the, the question was, how do you get Walmart to pay its taxes? How do you get Amazon to pay its taxes? And, and that's a lot easier for a giant corporation that has a lot of people that can be focused on this. You know, how do you get the, the person who is, is making T-shirts out of their basement in Englewood and selling them uh, to get to pay taxes is a lot harder. I mean, that's one person doing everything they can to run a business and then asking them to comply more and more is yeah. going to be tough. So I, I think the, the the question here is, is not, you know, completely, how do we make sure everyone complies, but how do we make sure compliance is not an right. overburdensome right. thing? Because that, if the answer is it's not overburdensome, then you will get yeah. people to comply. Agree. Well, and so thank you, Laurel. Thank you, Ed, for being here. I think this was a really interesting conversation. And, you know, thank you for also being kind of our our guinea pig on the, this is our first dual kind of sided conversation. So thank you for, for being our guinea pig. And Judy, as always, thank you for being here. I'm Meredith Smith, and this is Saltivation. This podcast is for educational purposes only and is not intended, nor should it be relied upon as legal, tax, accounting, or investment advice. You should consult with a competent professional to discuss specifics of your situation and the applicability of the information presented.